Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granik Allen. Last year, we celebrated the end of World War II. Sadly, due to COVID, many of the planned commemorations were significantly reduced or canceled altogether. So this year, as we mark the 76th anniversary, we here at Counterpoint have been trying to do our part by doing a series of shows highlighting the various aspects and events surrounding World War II. Well, today I want to discuss one of the lesser known yet brutal atrocities which occurred just a few days after the defeat of Hitler and the end of the war in Europe, the Bleiburg massacres. While much of Europe was cheering at the victory over Hitler, the deadly machine of communist Yugoslavia was warming up to swallow up countries in the region and its people whole. And if you were an anti-communist and fleeing, for many that meant death. The Yugoslav communist partisan regime started their brutal genocide in a little town of Bleiburg, Austria, under the nose of the British forces, and then proceeded to forcibly repatriate those fleeing communist dictator Tito. And by the time the commies were done, several years later, British records indicate that up to 700,000 unarmed men, women, and children were massacred, forcibly repatriated, bodies dumped in over 1,700 mass graves. These victims were predominantly Croatian, along with many Slovenians and Bosnians. Well, joining me now to discuss the Bleiberg genocide is Michael Palaic, a third-generation Croatian-American and producer of the documentary film, The Bleiberg Tragedy. He is also author of a book, For Baca's Homeland, Eyewitness to the Birth of a State. Thank you, Michael, so very much for joining me. I've seen excerpts of your documentary and it was very well done. And I'm so grateful that you did do that documentary. And I'm just really happy to have this discussion with you today on a very, very dark topic. Thank you, Tanya. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. And, you know, you've written and you've produced, you've written about Bleiberg, you've produced a documentary about it, uh, about the genocide. But you've grown up thousands of miles away in Detroit. You're an American, uh, third generation Croatian American, but you're an American. You know, why and how did you become so passionate about this tragedy? Well, the first uh, memories that I have of even hearing the term Bleiberg, actually, when it was my grandmother who told me about her nephews who were killed following World War II by the communists in Yugoslavia. And... Um, that was the first time I heard about any murders by the communists, and I was a very young boy. Uh, later, as I became older, I heard more stories from some eyewitnesses, from some people that had heard. And so it just, I, I really couldn't believe, I mean, I knew communism because I have, I'm old enough to live under so Soviet, the Soviet Union system and communism in Eastern Europe. So I, I know the negative aspects of communism. But I wanted to find out exactly what happened. So, so with that, I go ahead. Well, with that, I just started to um, uh, interview Croatian eyewitnesses who had escaped the massacres. M many of them did escape. Unfortunately, most of them did not escape. Uh, so that that kind of led me onto this uh, journey to find out exactly what happened. So again, assuming our audience probably has never heard of the Bleiberg massacres, you know, could you tell us what happened in the days leading up to May 15th, 1945, which is known as the start of these, these massacres, which actually carried on for several years after? Um, what was going on at the time? Where did these civilians come from? How did they end up in Austria? Yeah, so I think the best way to look and to understand what happened in May of 1945 is just to look back in our most recent past of 1991 to 1995 to see what happened when Yugoslavia disintegrated and fell apart and when people started to demand independence from both Yugoslavia and independence from communism. So with that, you know, there was oppression, killings, village after village was taken over by the Yugoslav army. People were massacred, women were raped. Uh, some of them were put into rape camps. Um, their houses were destroyed, churches destroyed, leveled, graveyards leveled. Um, so if we only have to look not just what happened to Croatians in 1991 and 95, but also what happened in Bosnia with the Bosnian Muslims, what happened in Slovenia, what happened then later 
in the Albanian regions of Kosovo, we can understand with a clearer picture, I think, of what happened in 1945. So it's basically the same thing. Welcome back. We're discussing the Bleiberg massacres with Michael Palaic, uh, producer of a documentary and author. Michael, thank you again for joining me here. Before the break, you were describing what happened in 1991 uh, through to, I guess, 1999, when people in the region of the former Yugoslavia tried to declare independence and get out of this communist regime as a potential explanation of what was probably happening in 1945. Yes, that's right. So these civilians, they understood they had four years from 1941 to 1945. They had the, the same kind of tragedy with the civil happened when the Yugoslav army came in. Of course, the end of the World War II was around May, May 8th when um, the Croatian civilians, along with the military as protection, headed northward towards the Austrian border with the intention of surrendering to the British Eighth Army, who were in southern, uh, they were in southern Austria at the time. That was their whole intent, intent, intention was to surrender. And so th they had this 200,000 soldiers and 500,000 civilians in this mass exodus from Croatia into southern Austria, arriving finally in May 14 uh, of May of uh, May of 1945. Let's put up a picture of, of the children on the caravans that were coming out. Like you said, there were, according to British estimates, 700,000 uh, men, women, and children fleeing. Here's an example. Clearly, you know, here young, young, very young children with looks like everything they had with them fleeing what was probably soon to be a very oppressive Yugoslav state again. Sorry, continue, Michael. Yeah, that's right. So. Um... We, we know that there were 500,000 civilians and 200,000 soldiers at the time because these uh, there were aerial photographs taken by Spitfire, British Spitfire airplanes that were flying overhead, photographing the, this mass exodus of people. And according to their documents, which I found in the, the war archives uh, of the war office in London, they, it was the British estimate there were 500,000 civilians, 200,000 soldiers, based on the photographs that they took from those Spitfires. And we have one of those documents. Could you throw that up on the screen while we continue our discussion, the one uh, that has the, the diary entry of the soldier's account? And you can see there, it's probably hard to see on your screen, but it says 500,000 civilians, 200,000 uh, men, soldiers. Uh, so it was quite, and this is again, according to British, uh, the official British war diary for that area. And so what happened? So they get to, to this area, Bleiburg, and then what happens? Well, they get to Bleiburg with the intention of surrendering to the British because they thought that the British would treat them honorably as uh, surrendered people um, and as civilians and offer them protection when instead General uh, Scott, who was the general for the uh, Royal Ar Irish Fusiliers for the British Eighth Army at the time in the area, set up a meeting between the partisans and the uh, Croatians, and they, the, uh, General Scott demanded that the Croatians surrender their arms. There was no debate, there was no negotiation. They were ordered, surrender your arms or else, basically. So still thinking that the British were gonna treat them fairly, they did surrender their arms. Of course, the civilians, the men, women, and children who were civilians had no arms at all to surrender. So they were just like sheep being led to the slaughter, basically. And, uh, and then what happened? What happened after they surrendered their arms? Once they surrendered their arms, uh, it may take a little time. And if I overstep the time, just let me know. But it, we can divide it into two areas, the Bleiburg massacre, that started in Bleiburg and then the subsequent death marches with the 700,000 civilians. The second part of that was even a, a fewer in number, but even more sinister in a way because the British army took an active role in, this, in these murders by putting the civilians into trains, into cattle cars, basically 60 to 80 
men, women, and children into cattle cars. Of what they did was they this is according to the Nigel Nicholson, who was the British intelligence officer who designed this whole scheme. He told these people that they were going to go into the trains and they would be sent to Italy for their protection. Once and he says, he says very uh, precisely, had we not had we told them the truth that we were going to send them back to Yugoslavia, none of them would have got onto the trains. So we didn't have any choice but to lie to them. Welcome back. We're discussing the Bleiberg massacres. And just before commercial, we're discussing what the British officers had witnessed and what they diarized and their role in all of this. Uh, let's let's play one of the clips from your film, Michael, uh, listening firsthand of the British officer's account and his role. Go ahead. We received uh, a specific orders from our division that they weren't to be told where they were going. Or... Um, <clears throat> Uh, and then, the, as naturally, they were very uh, anxious that they shouldn't be sent back to Yugoslavia and suspected this. We were told um, a little later, only a few days later, that um, we were to tell them definitely they were going back to Italy. If people are told the truth about where they're going, and they refuse to go because they will be killed, the only way to get them onto the trains is to lie to them about their destination. Wow, that's first-hand account. You you conducted that interview. I did I did that, I did that interview in 1989? Nigel Nicholson has since died, but um, thankfully I was able to get that primary source, very important primary source, before he died. So, what happened to these soldiers and and civilians once they were loaded onto these uh, cars? In that case, uh, those were mostly civilians uh, that were loaded onto those cattle cars. They uh, they kind of found their way into Austria later between end of May and the end of June. So it was well after World War II was over. Mm -hmm. End of June, they were still sending trains back to Yugoslavia. Now, the important thing about this, or interesting, is that the British, in their notes, in their documents that I've seen and that I've published, the notes themselves say that they are being sent back to a certain death. Now, that, So they knew that even before they sent them. Ironically, later, a couple of stragglers escaped the murders in Yugoslavia, fled back for a second time into southern Austria, told the British, you have to stop this. They're killing us over there. And the British put that individual, this is all according to the British documents that I found, British officers put him also back on the train and sent him for a second time to his death in Yugoslavia. My goodness. My goodness. Well, I, I think a lot of, well, I should say many people probably find it very hard to believe that these British soldiers could stand by while, um, and, and watch the slaughter of these men, women, and children. Uh, how, and again, just to make it very clear, how do we know that they didn't, that they didn't protest or did they protest any of this? Uh, you, the British officers? Yes. Uh, on occasion, they would protest and then they would be, for example, Nigel Nicholson did, to his credit, make a one, he, he kind of protested with one sentence saying that the soldiers, this was in his intelligence reports back to headquarters, that his, uh, the soldiers, the British soldiers found this practice to be repugnant. Wow. And, and he was, uh, he he said he was chastised for that, and then he he erased that immediately from further notes that he made. So why why did this happen? Why did the British sort of? Uh, did they? I mean, based on my research, they seem to have struck a deal with the devil, which was the partisan leader Tito, the and the, basically handed them over to the communist Yugoslavs. That's the ultimate question: Why the British did it? Uh, when I first started looking into this, being an American-born person, my father was in World War II. He was in the, the Army Air Corps, served in Europe during World War II. 
I'm a veteran of the American military. I grew up watching movies. I assumed that the British were honorable people and I just couldn't believe it. So when I went into this research, it was really to disprove what I had been hearing. Uh, unfortunately, I found that it, 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 it actually did happen and that they were um, part. Now, I, I can only assume that part of the reason why they, they let this happen and they kind of were complacent in this or um, uh, was because there were 500,000 civilians, 200,000 soldiers in Southern Austria. And they were, this was at the end of the war. So uh, they had to feed these people. They had to clothe these people. They had to maintain their livelihood. They, they had to do a lot of stuff. On top of that, the, the Yugoslav government under Tito was demanding parts of Trieste and parts of Southern Austria as the new Yugoslav territory. So I think that it was kind of, uh, they got rid of the Yugoslav partisans because they had to accompany this mass exodus of people back mm. to be murdered. So it took, a, it took all of the uh, partisans to accompany these people. Welcome back. We're discussing the, the very grisly topic of the Bleiberg uh, genocide, really, that started in Bleiberg, Austria, and continued, which had upwards of 700,000 uh, unarmed so soldiers, women and children essentially liquidated uh, in, in, in a crazy genocide. Um, Michael Polich, again, thank you for joining me. How, like 700,000 is a lot of people. How did this, these massacres, after they, they left Bleiberg and they were forcibly repatriated back to, to Yugoslavia, which was then Yugoslavia, what happened to these, these men, women, and children? So they were marched. Um, the one of the estimates, uh, one of the British officers who I also interviewed, um, Colin Gunner, who was a captain at the time, he was on the bridge in Lava Mund where this uh, this death march actually passed by him, and he was there at the bridge to make sure that the there were no problems with the partisans taking these uh, men, women, and children across the bridge. So he witnessed himself. Along that road, not even in Yugoslavia yet, still in Austria, where the murders began, and they were throwing bodies into the the Drava River, which borders uh, that former Yugoslavia with Austria. So he, as a British officer, says that he witnessed these things. Once they got into Yugoslavia, they basically immediately started killing. In what we in Croatian, the, the, the term is krizni put. Right. which is the uh, death march. Uh, so the death march began in Bleiburg, but it continued throughout many parts of Yugoslavia where they would uh, dispose of these people by killing them in all kinds of brutal ways, in addition to torturing them on the way. And they're, um, they threw them at the pits. They, I'm sorry. I was going to say there are over 1,700 uh, mass graves, over 1,700 mass graves of these that 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 are, are throughout these death march routes all the way back down into again the, the former Yugoslavia, but in basically Slovenia, many 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 in Slovenia, also in Croatia as well, even some in Bosnia. There you can see that on the map, um, and they threw them into pits. You were mentioning. Yeah, there's there's many caves throughout Croatia through Slovenia. Uh, these natural caves that go down sometimes hundreds of feet, a small hole into in the ground, but below the hole is just this cavern, three, four, five, 20 meters deep. And they would just kill people at the entrance to this hole by shooting them in the head or, or smashing them in the back of the skull and then throwing them into the pit, body after body after body. And they, they're digging up these graves even today exhuming bodies throughout uh, Croatia, Bosnia, uh, Slovenia. And there's one infamous called the Hudayama. It was a mass grave and former mine uh, pit where I understand it was meters deep that they buried thousands in alive in this mine pit and then basically walled them in with a meters deep wall. So there was no hope of escape. Can we show that clip, please, from a, a documentary which shows the, the archaeologists actually going in and discovering this, this genocide? Oh, 
You could just see piles and piles of bones and again, buried alive. Some people will say that these victims had what was coming to them, that uh, some of the dead soldiers were fighting with the Axis, for example, in World War II. What do you, how do you respond to that? Well, I would say a couple of things. One is, according to international law, we, don't, we do not force people to surrender their arms, no matter who they are, and then kill them. That's completely opposite to any Geneva Convention rules, any international rules of law that we have today or that we had there at the time. I asked actually a, a famous uh, war, a second world, uh, wartime prosecutor from the Second World War that took part in the Nuremberg prosecutions called Gerald Draper. And I have him on film in my documentary also. Gerald Draper says that there is no excuse once, a, no matter what the enemy happens to be or what the enemy is perceived to have done, there is nothing that justifies the killing of that unarmed soldier. Michael, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, we could spend hours talking about this. We all know somebody who's who's passed away and who was br basically brutally murdered in these genocides, uh, in this Bleiberg genocide. So thank you so much for sharing your information with us today. Thank you, Tanya. It's a pleasure, really. This episode was dedicated to the hundreds of thousands of lives lost in the Bleiberg genocide.